Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 47 of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A, where your questions and votes really do drive the show. Please do use the slider link um, in the chat to vote up the questions that you would most like answered. And of course, to add your own and put those directly to the panel. We've got some folks who are working on social media for you. So they'll pick up those questions and get them straight into Slido um, to help you out. All right. So please do do that. Level Up, as you know, is live on Mondays at 8 a.m. and Fridays at 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, we live stream to both YouTube and to LinkedIn. And behind the scenes is quite fascinating. So we, we might do a, a Level Up show behind the scenes at some point, share that with you. And um, just for my panelists, co-panelists today, if you could just make a little note in the chat that you can read the chat for me, then that would be brilliant. Okay, so just forgot to ask you that before we went live. Okay, good. So you can find out if you're watching us online, um, much more about what we do, of course, by visiting our website, which is apmg-international.com. Very easy to find and then just go for Level Up. Okay. And um, if you search for Level Up, you'll find the homepage and lots and lots of resources that you can tap into there. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build your career in the world of public-private partnerships, how you start, you know, how do you build it and where do you go from there? And what are the really the key things to think about for your career? So we're going to jump straight in, meet our um, experienced panel, okay, who are waiting for your questions. Um, so uh, joining us um, uh, today is Nia Nanso Ekinem. He is, of course, the managing consultant over at Wear Capacity in Nigeria, strong supporter of Level Up. Thank you very much, as are all of our panelists today. He brings deep domain experience of working in both the public and the private sector. So, welcome back, Nia Nanso. Great to see you. Thank you for having me, and uh, good to be here again. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you very much. Andre Kruger um, joins us from South Africa. He's the CEO and uh, the lead trainer of PPP Online, who are, I have to say, a kind of a tour de force in upskilling people to gain the various World Bank qualifications and get the understanding that they need in order to be able to build a career around PPPs. Welcome back, Andre. Uh, great to see you again. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good to be online again and look forward to have a discussion with the participants. So regards here from South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And of course, as your summer is starting to fade a little bit, hopefully not quite so hot for you, but quite pleasant um, weather. In the UK, we are heading towards um, spring, which will be really nice for us. We're really looking forward to that. Um, Sergey Samli, he's uh, joining us today from um, PPP Expertise. Of course, you will remember Sergey and Amandeep and Andre and Nianancio from earlier episodes of Level Up, where we've been talking about public-private partnerships. Um, Sergey, thank you so much for making time uh, today to join us. Great to have you back again. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Glad to be back. And um, greetings to all participants and all viewers. Hey, thank you very much indeed. And uh, Amandeep Singh also returns to our panel today um, uh, on his um, uh, CV, actually. He mentioned that he was one of the, f he led the first mover team on a $1.5 billion, wow, that was some project, uh, PPP transaction in East Africa. And is currently, of course, um, working over at the World Bank. So welcome back, Amandeep, my friend. Very good to see you again. Many thanks, Nick, and good to be in the panel again. And greetings to the all the viewers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So to everybody who is watching um, online, don't be shy. Introduce yourselves, please, in the chat. You can see lots of people already on LinkedIn, which is great, and also on YouTube. Um, just say hello. Tell us where you're coming from in the world, where you're tuning in from, and um, you know, let's get the conversation started. Think of a question. Type it in the chat and we'll put it in front of our panel. The person doing that for us today is our question master. Uh, her name is Charlotte Miller and she is joining us from the Thames Valley here in the UK. Um, so Charlotte, please, may we have our first question? You may, Nick. We've got a question from Ngozi Michael. What are the procedures required to become a PPP specialist? All right. So how do you actually go about doing this? Sergey, start us off and then we'll hear from Amandeep. Uh, 
the procedure to be, it takes um, passing three exams, foundation level, then uh, PPP projects, uh, preparation and execution. So they take three exams that one needs to take uh, to become a PPP specialist. But of course, the decision is for every applicant. Does he self-study? Does he take a self-paced course? Does he uh, attend a live course or an online course? There are ways to study to get ready for these three exams. Okay, all right. Thank you very much indeed. So a very clear structure there to the overall qualifications. We might come back to that again in a little while. Um, Amandeep, what are your thoughts on the journey towards becoming a specialist? Uh, no, so the first of all, the, uh, one need, what is public-private partnership? The mainly dealing with the infrastructure, right? whether it's a core infrastructure or social infrastructure. So any professional, one thing need to be here that they need to know the life cycle of the infrastructure projects, how they work, right from inception to their, you know, whole life cycle culmination. So that, that is the basic foundation uh, to become a PPP specialist. And then definitely from the various uh, aspects or streams, whether it's a technical, financial, legal, and other uh, aspects, financing aspects need to be uh, learned. And as Sergey rightly said, so one anyone who wants to become a ppp professional started started with the cp3p course starting with the foundation level and then going forward so learning by experience and do the jobs on hand and then experience is the key to become a ppp specialist all right excellent thank you very much indeed and answer what are your thoughts so i think um th there is the there is the background um academic knowledge you need you know first as background academic knowledge because uh, there's a minimum knowledge you know you need to have in terms of academics to to be able to be a specialist then you need the professional knowledge so first is the background academic then the professional knowledge now going to the professional there are several options to becoming a specialist one is going through training and um, i think the most comprehensive one is the cp3p uh, certified public private partnership professional training by the APMG is very, very comprehensive. But you have to go through the training to understand public-private partnership process and project life cycle and all that. Then being, adding that, making sure you practice that training, I mean, applying it because you can have the knowledge, but you don't have the experience. So it's very important that background academic knowledge, professional training, and applying that knowledge to become a, a, a true specialist for PPP. Thank you. I would completely um, agree with that. But the, the challenge always is, you know, you apply for jobs and the job says you must have five years of experience of, of doing this. <laughs> okay, this kind of thing. And it's really frustrating because, you know, you might have the aptitude to do something, but you don't have the experience yet. Okay, you've not got those flying hours, if you like, of doing it for, for real. So you've got to start somewhere. So the qualifications, if you like, are your passport because they prove to a third party that you understand what it is that you need to be able to understand. So that is very, very helpful about getting yourselves into that situation where you can meet somebody online or face to face, you know, and talk to them about getting involved in the work around PPPs. But, and here's the thing, okay, I would suggest the journey towards becoming a specialist is to embrace being a generalist earlier. <laughs> Okay. Build your career with broad and deep foundations before choosing to specialise in one particular aspect. Um, a little while ago, a few months ago, we were having a discussion about um, the financial instruments that are used to construct and support the funding for PPP projects. And they're quite complex. And that is a specialism all in its own right. So the whole kind of world that is around uh, public-private partnerships from pre-contract to um, building those alliances, building that sense of purpose, managing stakeholders, and so on and so on and so on, there's such a spectrum of activity within it that uh, you know, start off with the generalism, build your firm foundation, and then move on from there. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Great question to start us off on this particular journey. Sorry, Nina. So would you like to add something? Oh yeah. Um so so I agree totally about you know being a generalist. You know, you do, do something general because 
Um, what we've shared in our, you know, training sessions is that, look, anyone can, you know, be active in the PPP space, whether you've come from the human resources, you know, experience or you've come from um, communications experience, you know, you can apply that knowledge in public-private partnership. You know? So um, it doesn't matter, you know, the opportunity you have in terms of applying your academic knowledge or working professionally, no matter the background you have or the experience, it can come in very, very useful in public-private partnership space. And so you can decide, just like you said, um, and Nick, you can decide which of the areas within the PVP space you want to be, um, uh, be, be a specialist. So it could be within the legal or the technical or the financial, but it's a wide range of knowledge. It's a multidisciplinary space where the professional knowledge can be very effective so it doesn't matter, you know, the experience you've gained, it can be very useful in the PVP space. Completely agree. Thank you very much indeed. So very good. Thank you uh, for that question to get us going, Ngozi. And, um, you know, let's move on. We'll take our next question, please, Charlotte. Thanks, Nick. Our question from Gabrielle Bobby. Are there specific courses one must study and or skills one must have to become a PPP specialist? Uh, so your thoughts to get us going on this one, please. Sorry, Andre, we can't hear you. So we can't hear you at the moment, Andre. Let's come back to Andre in a moment and uh, we'll hear from Nianzo first and then we'll go back to Andre next. Okay, so I mean, this question has been asked quite a number of times during our, our training courses. You know, uh, someone would say, okay, I studied um, um, mass communication or I studied uh, sociology, uh, but I hear that it's only lawyers you need in PPP or you need financial analyst. And we tell them, no, I mean, sociology is actually very, 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 very important in PPPs because there are some aspects you need to engage, you know, communities, you need stakeholder engagement, you need to understand the social strata in communities, how you engage engagement processes using uh, the proper tools for social engagement. And so whatever you study, you know, so there's no, there are no specific courses that would limit you from becoming a PPP specialist. However, uh, within the PPP space, you must ensure that whatever course you study can become a professional, you know, a venture for you within the PPP space. So, for instance, you're studying sociology. Sociology can be applied in the aspect of community engagement, you know, so you must ensure that your, your study of sociology will be focused on that engagement aspect that can be valuable to PPPs. And so, yeah, you know, point blank answer, there are no specific courses you need, you need to be uh, um, a PVP specialist. Almost all the courses you, know, you might study in the university uh, can be very useful in the PVP space. However, those courses must be translated to the specific areas within, within a PVP project life cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Andre, I hope that we've kind of thrown a shovel of coal onto the internet, <laughs> got your audio back for us. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the courses for study and the skills that we need to acquire? Uh, I wanted to speak about the skills of managing a social media system. <laughs> and I need a course okay. in that space. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, okay. I wanted to talk about the the skills required uh, and, and uh, in, in PPP transactions, and then and then again through through training uh, a few hundred people already through our organisation, one one just realised that it's literally an integration of of the various uh, sectors that people work in, uh, individual skills of of, of people. So um, I would argue that it's the ability of any one of us. To be able to integrate and and even although we are a specialist maybe a financial specialist maybe a legal specialist important to understand the engineers difficult uh, sometimes especially for a finance guy like me to understand the engineers but uh, we try very hard to do that but you've got to be able to integrate the various disciplines um, when we work in, in 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 this space we really get quite a number of engineers we get economists and very interestingly, economists actually, especially the macroeconomists, 
they can see the big picture. And sometimes we need to see the big picture and not only focus as, as the specialist that I am, being an environmental specialist or whatever it may be. So I think people best suited to the PPP space and actually to lead in the PPP space, to maybe be the project manager in the government team, maybe leave the private sector consortium that will be bidding, or even leading one day the contract management team, overseeing the transaction. Um, it's definitely a significant career opportunity for those guys that can also integrate uh, between the various disciplines. Thanks. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Sergey, this is quite a broad topic, so I want to bring you in next, and then we'll hear from Amandeep, if we can. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Nick. Um, indeed, we, we covered certainly the certified PPP professional as the uh, universally recognized credential, and uh, many of the other speakers um, mentioned the specializations, various areas which are specific uh, hard skills which are required in for, for, for a typical PPP project. That could be engineering, law, uh, finance. I wanted to, to, to take a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, what any kind of PPP in, in any um, sector, I think, what they have in common, they're complex deals. And getting back to your, Nick, your initial point about being a good generalist, I think that's very valid. Uh, and there are courses that you could find courses which speak of uh, management of complex projects, uh, dealing with complexity, dealing with behavioristic issues. There are so many biases that influence decision making in PPPs. I would say take a course in, uh, in logic, just take a course in um, uh, games theory. So these things could be very important in any kind of application PPP to be able to see the logic of various players, uh, procuring authority, SPV, lenders. There's a complex network of, of relations, and one needs to be a good journalist, know how to uh, make decisions in the conditions of complexity and limited information. So think outside of the box. I would suggest go beyond just PPP and just core uh, sexual skills. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And Amandeep, final thoughts on this? Yeah, so just, uh, you know, um, panelists have already, you know, made clear that, okay, one need to be generalist, multidisciplinary, who can interweave the different aspects. Now, the question is the PPP specialist per se. So any discipline, mm -hmm. education or professional, for example, a socialist, a PR expert, communication expert, can work on a PPP project, but it's different from a being a PPP specialist. Okay, Good so point. so uh, yeah. even an engineer can work on a PPP project, but it's different from the PPP specialist. And as Andre Sergey Danyansu said, so a PPP specialist who can interview all these aspects, whether it's technical, financial, legal, communication, all these are the big pillars for a successful PPP projects. So one can interview all these aspects and make the complex deal work is a PPP specialist, and that will come irrespective of the which discipline you come, engineering, legal, financial, it comes with experience. It comes with experience mm -hmm. of doing the projects and thinking at a very global level that, okay, I, this needs to be done. And that's, that's, that's the reason the whole life cycle and the multidisciplinary weaving of the aspects is more important become a real PPP specialist. I, I, I think you're so right there, and it's really good. So thank you, panel, for you know differentiating there as well between the kind of the journey to that leadership role. You know, the, the, the leader has to understand what's going on. So if we take a musical analogy, you know, the, the conductor understands the score, understands where where things are going and knows when to bring in and, you know, bring up, you know, certain sections of the orchestra at the right time and with the right amount of energy in order to be able to get the whole piece, you know, delivered uh, fantastically, you know, for um, the stakeholders. So it's, it's a really, really important thing to do um, not to rush into those leadership positions. You know, we, we're all ambitious people makes a lot of sense but you actually do benefit hugely from the experience of you know making your career building your career over a period of time 
so that you get to a stage where you don't have to push yourself forward. People just ask you, they just invite you, come along, help us out with this, you know, help us pull this idea together and get this complex deal underway. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Um, so we're going to move on now. Let's take our next question, please. Thanks, Nick. We've got a live viewer question, and it's from Ahmed Abraham. PPP was there for a long time. What are the incentives that can be made to foster and activate a socially effective strategy? Okay. So if a public-private partnership has been around, at least conceptually, for a very long time, which is absolutely true, what are those incentives that could help act as a catalyst, if you like, to get socially effective strategies working. Um, Andre, you've done a, a lot of work with different communities um, over the years. What are your thoughts on how best to make that magic happen? Allow me to, to, to answer it from a practical project perspective. I think where the private sector consortium was very active uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, dealing with the social aspects successfully. Um, water project in South Africa, uh, more or less 22, 23 years old, the PPP project in, in, in this country. Uh, many of the citizens of the area under the responsibility of the PPP uh, uh, consortium previously did not have water. Uh, previous attempts by the municipality to deliver water to that area has been met with vandalism, of the equipment, the pipes, et cetera, people making unlawful connections, et cetera. So people were not very happy to now hear that they need to pay for the water. And then we entered into a concession, as I've said a number of years ago. Part of the concessionaire's responsibility was then, um, it was a user pay project. So the users in this municipal area, or a portion, a part of the municipal area, had to be uh, communicated with and, in a sense, uh, capacitated, um, uh, brought into the project, uh, getting them comfortable with the notion that we've got a public sector entity that's a private sector entity that's going to deliver the water to them in the future, that's going to build them and collect them. And this private sector entity, initially it was buy water from, from the UK, uh, that was the concessionaire. And they really managed to involve and incorporate uh, the local community completely in the project to such an extent that when they started issuing bills they didn't start issuing bills from day one they realized that there's a lot of communication bringing in the community into the project getting them comfortable with this idea getting them to understand that the infrastructure is theirs they need to protect the infrastructure over the years the project is now more than 20 years old they have really succeeded to the side of them, we have still have the municipality with its own area of jurisdiction where they still deliver water to the communities. Interestingly, that the municipality allowed the concessionaire to charge a higher fee currently than what is paid in the municipal area. And that is based on a five-year revision uh, uh, recognized process to, for the municipality to control the tariffs charged by the private sector. So in the concession area, people are paying more for the water, but they are looking after the assets. They are paying, the collection rate is better than in the municipal area. And they have really bought into the concept of, we need to pay for good service. So I'm not sure if I'm really answering the question uh, of, of Ahmed uh, in, in, in this space, uh, but just uh, I, I'm, I'm just bringing that forward as a very good, uh, example of a private sector consortium getting full buy-in from a community and delivering a successful successful project. Thank you. I, 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 and I think no, I think that you have all right because that's a very practical problem, isn't it? You know that is something that um, it requires um, a, a level of buy-in. You know, <laughs> absolutely, all of these things have an impact. You know, whether yeah. you're whether you're building infrastructure or delivering services, whether it's service-led PPPs or, or physical, you know, infrastructure-led PPPs, you know, they all have an impact on people's daily lives during the construction, during the use. Uh, to your point, 
you know, looking after it and funding it and paying for it over a very, very long period of time, typically. So, you know, it's absolutely vital, you know, to get the community on board. Um, Amandeep, what, what are your thoughts on this about building that socially effective strategies? Uh, Amandeep, we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll come from a different angle that, okay, the social or uh, the social masses need to be, you know, get uh, affected positively by the PPPs. So one of the way is to structure the payment mechanism from the pri for the private sector. To structure a payment mechanism to the private sector that, if, for example, a social uh, project like a healthcare, and you want, or government want that below poverty line should be treated in without uh, much of the fee or a very restricted fee. And then you incentivize the private sector based on the payment structure that if, they, say for example, the baseline is they have to treat 10% of the masses below poverty line free of cost. But if they do better or more patients coming to the hospital, and then you pay them better incentive. So you are doing better service to the social or the below, below poverty line uh, masses. So there are different ways to, you know, effective the social uh, masses or the strategy. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I totally agree with that. I was involved with a, a project, not directly, but indirectly hearing about it in uh, Europe when a deep water port was being extended. And, and one of the communities that was really seriously impacted by it were all of the people who had bought the very expensive waterfront um, apartments okay, overlooking this kind of very, very pleasant, you know, kind of part of uh, their country. And um, these lorries and trucks were just going past day and night, day and night, day and night for years. You know, so stakeholder engagement um, happens all up and down the uh, economic, you know, communities. You are not separated from it, even if you are independently, you know, kind of wealthy at the top of the food chain, so to speak. You know, it can impact everybody. Uh, Nianansu, your thoughts, please, to finish. Yes, I think, um, I mean, those those two points from Andre and Amandip are, are very valid points. You know, one is about, you know, um, engaging with the communities and the other one is um, incentivizing the private sector to, you know, to have the confidence to invest, you know, to ensure that uh, they get paid, you know. But, I mean, I think the, just using another project I've been part of, a water project as well, where um, you need to build confidence and trust in the, in the communities because first, most of the communities, particularly across Africa, they don't trust the private sector. So you need to build confidence early on that, look, the private guy is not just coming to take your money, uh, but also they don't trust the government. So government has to do a lot, you know, to build that confidence in the communities that, look, this project is for you. We are not trying to rip you off. Uh, using that example, which we, we were part of a water project, um, you know, the communities were supposed to, each household was supposed to pay for a water meter. And the private sector did its model based on, you know, fixed payment for the meter. However, you know, after discussions with the communities and engaging, uh, it was realized that, look, they couldn't afford it. And so um, it was agreed with the private entity that, look, payment can be done over three years, you know. So um, you're here for a 10-year concession, so you can have a three years, you know, where they can pay for water meters. And the communities were very happy. Uh, they had the confidence, you know, in, in the private entity, and also they, they had the, the understanding, and they were clear that look, the private sector had their interests as hard. So it was spread over three years, and so they were able to pay for their meters over a three-year period, and, uh, and that built the confidence in the community to be paying their water tariff as well. So, so, so there are several options, you know, trying to um, put in a mechanism to improve social effectiveness in, in, in projects. Yeah, right. So very good. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Some great thoughts there around that community engagement and thinking about how do you advantage some in order to be able to support the value generation for everybody and uh, make sure that that infrastructure is actually, you know, not just delivered uh, initially, but actually managed through to maturity as well. Excellent. Let's move on then, please. And we'll take our next question, um, if we can, Charlotte. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, question from Lucas Kaiser. 
Should practitioners from the private sector capacitate themselves to become PPP professionals? All right, very good. Amandeep, start us off, please, and then we'll hear from Nian Anso. A very good question indeed. Uh, it is very important that the private sector, especially who are working on the infrastructure and PPP projects, need to be capacitated. And reason is that if they do, they will uh, then the failure of PPP will become lower. The why you know I've seen many developing countries, the private sector come and bid for the projects without giving any thought. Their bid manager simply comes and look at the RFP and simply submit the bids. And later on, if they won, and later they later on they repent. Oh, sorry, we didn't saw this clause, or we didn't understood the whole uh, you know mechanism of the payment, etc. So it's very important. And many projects did fail, including in India, because of the lack of capacity of the private sector to you know think through what bid should be and uh, unnecessarily just to you know uh, just in the lack of knowledge of the whole ppp life cycle they submit any kind of bid and then later on project got failed I, th I think you make a really good point now because no, no matter how good you are okay if you don't understand the ecosystem in which you are working if you don't understand the ethos of public private partnership then it's you're going to struggle okay because they're complicated and there are so many moving parts all right so you really really do need to kind of steep yourselves in it if you're from the um, government side if you're from the public sector if you're from the private sector you really do need to spend time okay and get underneath the skin of these things uh Nian, so next then please and then we'll hear from sergey Yes, um, I think the point blank answer to this question is yes. You know, the private sector needs to, you know, cons consistently over time improve capacity. You know, you need to build your capacity, you know, to remain, not just become a PP professional, remain a professional over a long period of time. Now, first is that you, you know, there's this assumption that the private sector has the answer. So when you come to private uh, PPPs, the private sector can do everything. No, you must understand PPP process. You must understand PPP this life cycle, you must understand, you know, the concept of PPPs and how they are delivered. And so you don't just come in because you've delivered projects as a private entity, whether, you know, because you understand project management or what you've delivered construction projects in the past. And so it's easy to deliver PPPs. No, yeah, the, you know, it's a different ball game totally. So yes, private entities need to improve their capacity to understand PPPs and become PPP professionals to be able to deliver successful projects. Now, on, in terms of delivering projects, now private entities would need to be very careful because every project is different. Every project is different. So you don't just use templates and think, okay, you know, it's the same thing we did for this health project, so we can do it for the water project. No, it's a whole total ball game when it comes to water and health, they're different. And so be very careful, make sure you understand all the you know, requirements and make sure you prepare your team to deliver based on the requirements and all that. So yes, private entities need to consistently improve their capacity to be PP professionals. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Really good advice there. Sergey, what's your experience in this? What are your thoughts? Um, sure, my um, black and white answer is very clearly it is a yes, as uh, Zamandeep as Nian also has said. I would just add um, the perspective of um, PPP professionals. If we're talking about certified PPP professionals, the um, certification is based on the perspective of the public sector. And it's mainly, I think, targeted as public sector, which is of, often perceived as the bottleneck in terms of uh, capacity. When there is a major project, uh, very often you, you can see that the private sector, a uh, public sector, may lack some uh, PPP structuring um, uh, skills. But in, in what we do, we, we see more and more that the private sector is uh, turning up, uh, asking for, for training, uh, developing their skills. Uh, some of the uh, private sector are just entering PPPs. You can be a, a very successful road construction company, but if you only were working on um, EPC contracts uh, just uh, as, a, as a contractor, and now, you see that there are more and more work um, 
procured as PPPs. You've got to develop this capacity. You've got to start thinking about uh, maybe you never uh, provided equity to SPV. You never actually took a long-term view of the project. So now you need to do that to, to really to participate in, in bidding for those uh, contracts. So there's a lot of uh, um, capacity to be developed in the public-private sector as well. And it, um, as Nianansu said, it's, uh, it's an ongoing process. It's not just, um, doesn't end your journey as a professional <clears throat> in the private sector, doesn't really end with, uh, let's say, gaining all three levels of uh, CP3P and saying, I'm a professional lifetime. There's so much new regulation, new perspective like environmental, social, climate change, so many of uh, new aspects. So you need to keep educating yourself and increasing your capacity as a PPP professional in the private sector uh, to be successful. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Andre and then Nian Anso. Yeah, I, um, uh, I fully agree with my colleagues that um, uh, we need the private sector. We need the private sector bidders. We need the private sector transaction advisors um, of all the various disciplines to, to know something better. Does this sound familiar to you around the campfire or the or the bry? This government entity that's procuring this new project, the roads project, they don't know what they are doing. Many times, many times, the private sector are just as ignorant about the routes that the, the public sector need to adhere to, to bring the project to market. And once they bring the project to market, the private sector don't always fully understand what the public sector guys had to go through to bring the project to this end and what they then uh, in turn need to do to prepare for project uh, bidding um, so it's absolutely necessary i also agree with sergey um, this year so far we had 80 percent of the candidates that, that enrolled for the courses were from the private sector most of them interestingly from the consulting engineering space those guys that play specifically play a role on the public sector side. They are act as transaction advisors on, 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 on that side. So yeah, it's absolutely important to get these guys to, to understand. Um, I, I know the popular thing is to say that government don't know what they do, um, but guess what? And I'm coming from the private sector side. <laughs> um, sometimes we also do not properly understand and properly comprehend what is at stake. Obviously, we've got very experienced private sector companies that are deeply uh, uh, developed and, and, and have, ten, have done 10 PPP transactions before, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, in short, um, they need to. They need to understand much better. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nian Anso. Final thoughts on this one? Yeah, just, um, just to highlight the, the, the fact that or the need for continuous uh, you know, and consistent learning and the improving capacity for the private sector, but also the public sector. Uh, example with COVID-19, um, a lot of changes have happened. And so we need to learn a lot and improve or change, make some changes in terms of how we structure projects. You know, that, that, you know there was a big, a major disruption. So the private sector will need to learn a lot from that and uh, that change, changes things as well. Uh, but also what's happening in Europe right now, um, it's a significant change, you know. So, a lot of people didn't see this coming, but either it has happened. And so, you know, when you structure a project before, you know, before January this year, you would say, okay, that, that is not possible that would happen. But yeah, that has happened. And so things are changing fast. So private entities will need to learn and consistently improve their capacity uh, to ensure that projects are structured better, you know, you know looking at unforeseen um, situations. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, um, panel. You're you're absolutely right. Now, um, I just want to talk directly, if I may, to you know all of the folks who are watching on LinkedIn and YouTube. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. I can see the chat's really busy actually on both platforms. So fantastic, and uh, some great comments and some lovely feedback for us. So thank you very much for all of those folks who are typing that in on LinkedIn. Um, our co colleagues are really loving the interaction with you. So please keep doing that and get your questions in so that we can answer them. All right. Otherwise, we, we just kind of have to talk amongst ourselves, which is never fun. Okay. You're, you are driving the show with the questions and voting up 
the questions that you most like answered. Now, on that point, Charlotte, let's um, move on, please, if we can. And we'll take the next question, please. Thank you, um, Nick. We've got a live question that's just come in. Um, Modu OJ, <laughs> sorry about the pronunciation. How to okay. track job opportunities to work as a PP specialist, either in a job or an independent consultant? All right. OK. How do you go about tracking job opportunities in such a specialist area? Um, Andre, start us off with this. What, would, what advice would you give? Where would you look? I will, I will suggest a soft approach, meaning that you've got to build networks. Um, just today, earlier today, we completed uh, one of the training programs uh, with engineers online, um, engineers, property guys, uh, construction companies, so civil engineer type, type, type guys. They are in a consortium and they are developing already projects in, in government and they realize that the government entity is not as strong. And they've got subcontractors. That's probably the starting point, to, to, to try and participate as a subcontractor in uh, transaction advisory work. Maybe more difficult to act as a subcontractor in a vested private sector consortium. That may be difficult. So I would suggest um, if you can uh, try and get to know the construction companies, the consulting engineers, maybe if you're in the legal space, uh, speak to the uh, legal companies uh, actively involved in PPPs and try and get a piece of subcontract work that, and, and get to know the people and let them net get to know you. So my approach would be soft approach, go in and network. Uh, and network again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amandeep. Yeah, completely agree with Andrew. So networking is the key for professional like us or the PPP specialist. However, uh, so one is that, okay, look at for different companies and all. Once you get good experience, you can go to the multilateral development banks websites. They do hire individual consultants like ADB, World Bank, others. So you can look at, watch out their uh, uh, job opportunity websites. And another point, do a good job, whether you're an engineer, lawyer, uh, or, or communication expert working on PPP. If you do a good job, uh, we it's a it's a world where you know word of mouth is the key. You know, so, so it is it spreads like fire that okay that guy has done a marvelous job on that transaction. So you definitely get cold calls. Uh, yeah, so that is another key point to keep in mind. Yeah, I, th I think that that is really, really important. Um, uh, let's hear from Sergey and then Nia Nanso, and then I'll come back in. Yeah, absolutely agree with what Andre and um, Amandeep said uh, in terms of developing your network and looking for job opportunities that are posted. Um, I was just also going to say um, what uh, Amandeep already did. The multilateral development banks, the likes of ADB, EBRD, World Bank, you could ha you can uh, get logged in, get registered for uh, calls for consultants um, as an individual consultant or as a firm, um, and uh, look for those opportunities. And in a more generic way, LinkedIn I think still is a very powerful um, uh, tool, and it's uh, marketing yourself as a candidate. Just post about yourself, about your um accomplishments uh, your certificates the projects you worked in not necessarily with a, a very obvious drive to sell yourself but maybe share some insights some uh, some uh, some knowledge uh, some interesting facts about projects uh, make sure you use tags and um, uh, you'll be noticed uh, when i was a, was a managing director for a bank and uh, uh, ran an infrastructure finance team when we needed when we had to find someone to work in-house or on a project very often we'll start with linkedin i'll just type in ppp and let's say um, uh, cfa and cp3p at that point was was not yet present so uh, ppp cfa and the country where uh, we have this project and this is my starting list of, of potential candidates so you've got to be there to be visible Thank you very much indeed, Nian Anso. Yes, I, am, I agree totally with, with 
I think it's, it's, just the, it's just the best way to, to get them um, hired. But first, be sure you're a PAP specialist because um, um, if you want to get a specialist job, you need to be a specialist because there's a huge gap in terms of you know, available skills, available specialists. There's a huge gap. And so there's a demand for skills. We, we actually need skills. So um, um, for us, some of the consulting jobs we're doing, uh, PPP transaction advisory services, we need skills. We're looking for people. But we're looking for people that are good, people that are you know, good at what they do. So first, be sure you're good at what you do. Then next, referrals are very, very important. We rely a lot on referrals. And so if you know someone that knows you and knows your skills and what to do, what, what you can do, um, let that person refer you because we will have confidence in someone um, we've worked with in the past or someone we have confidence in. And then if that person refers you, then we say, okay, we are sure it's coming from this person. But first, network, be sure you're, you're good at what you do and get referrals in place. Thank you. Yeah, um, really, really good advice. So um, do not do not underestimate the power of networking in these situations, okay? But also don't underestimate what you're asking another person to do. If they're genuinely going to refer you, then it's their reputation that is at stake. So what you want to do, in my humble opinion, <laughs> also be on LinkedIn every day, is um, first of all, if you're early career, then take the time to um, share what it is that you are doing. You know, um, the number of times that people have applied for roles and they've said that they led something when actually they did a really great job, but they were not leading the whole endeavor. They were a strong contributor to it. So be honest and, you know, um, be open and speak from the heart, you know, when you're positioning what it is that you're actually doing, because um, the number of leadership positions is relatively small. The number of uh, positions to make strong contributions is much, much bigger. So the way to build your network is to show that you can do the doing, all right, and do that. The other thing that I would say is about you know qualifications. Um, the World Bank CP3P qualifications they all come with a digital credential, a digital badge, which is linked through to a secure database. And of course, you can share those on social media. So they are a fantastic way to begin a conversation. All right. As are the groups that are out there, all to do with PPPs, with project management, with change management, with um, delivering benefits for citizens. For there's a whole range, aren't there, of communities of interest, you know, that you can join, make a contribution, you know, add some value to those communities before trying to uh, take something from them is generally the right way around. I think that works pretty well. Good. Excellent. So we're going to move on. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one or possibly two questions. Depends on uh, our answers. So Charlotte, please, can we take the next question? We can, Nick. We've got a question from Anna in Bangalore, India. I'm an engineer by profession. What are the skill sets I need to get become a PPP specialist? All right. So if you're starting from an engineering background and in the week in which we're celebrating um, International uh, Women's Day and so on. So fantastic. Thank you, Anna, for flying the flag for STEM subjects and being an engineer. It's brilliant. Um, Sergey, what would your advice be for the engineer? And then we'll hear from Amandi. When I heard engineer, I, I immediately remembered um, a recent survey of professions where um, there was a comparison of first, your first university degree and the likelihood of be becoming rich in life. So it turns out engineering is the best degree <clears throat> to have to be, uh, have a very high net, net worth um, um, mid-late uh, career. So um, Anna, you're on a very good track uh, having started uh, as an engineer. And of course, engineer, um, engineering uh, skills, uh, mindset are, uh, are certainly very useful in PPPs. So I would say, first of all, either you stay within the technical domain of PPPs, then maybe there are some specialized um, technical skills that you need, or maybe it's quite likely that, that you may want to upgrade your skills in uh, the financial aspects, in the legal aspects, because you, you will become a, a wider range specialist. You may have better chances of being promoted to a team leader uh, and so on and so forth. So if there are PPP, specifically PPP um, certified or non-certified 
uh, uh, courses to enhance your skills, and maybe courses in those adjacent areas like finance, law, uh, procurement, project management, maybe these could be useful for you. Thank you very much indeed. Amandeep, please. Yeah, I completely agree with Sergey. So yes, engineering is the one profession which is very well fit into the PPP over. And uh, yes, other skill sets can be, uh, skill set or the uh, degrees can be uh, done to become a PPP specialist. However, if Anna, you can't uh, do that, like another financial analysis, analytics or legal understanding, Still in the engineering profession, you can contribute. Only thing you need to change your looking at the infrastructure, how it works. Uh, that normally hardcore engineers look at the input uh, for the for any infrastructure uh, as, uh, uh, infrastructure asset. However, PPP is all about outputs. So, so even for example, it is always a very good requirement to create performance standards for the infrastructure assets the performance standards both for the construction and then during the o and m it need to be output specific and hardcore engineers do make a mistake to provide inputs instead of outputs uh, for simple example for example if a healthcare project you need to put lighting in a th operation theater one way is to you uh, you tell uh, specify that you need x wattage of bulbs of 100 or, or 10 bulbs of x wattage that's input Rather, you said, oh, I want this much lex levels, or illumination level into the uh, operation theater 24 by 7. Uh, so then it doesn't matter how many bulbs or tubes uh, private sector is putting in. We are going about the lux levels. So there's a perception need to be changed. And accordingly, that skill set, if you bring into a, your engineering profession, that will be good and there will be good opportunities for that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Great answers. Uh, Nir Nanso, your thoughts? Um, it's good to hear that engineers are high net worth individuals, so I'm looking forward to buying my Ferrari. <laughs> okay, so Anna, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's interesting that, um, yeah, so you have a, a good background already, um, which is on demand in terms of PPP projects. Uh, um, just like uh, Amandeep said, you need to now think a bit differently. So we, we offer this course to the Professional Engineering Association in Nigeria, where we teach only engineers PPPs. And it's a very, very interesting course because we're focusing on engineers that are used to, you know, um, you know technical design, foundation design, you know, the design cantilevers, the build structures. And you now start telling them, no, you need to focus on service levels and service level agreements. So you need to start understanding what agreements mean, you know. You need to understand that relationship but also understand the entire PPP process and PPP life cycle, meaning you need to understand the financial aspect of PPPs. So when the financial modeler tells you, no, this doesn't look good, you as an engineer, even if that's not your core area, you need to understand it as a minimum, understand what they're saying in terms of internal rate of return. So just understand it, not, not being an expert. And secondly, um, you need to understand um, um, the legal aspect understand um, uh, um, um, project planning and project management. Because the moment you come into a PEP space, um, the management of projects and planning on projects are very, very critical. And so as an engineer, you have a good background already, but you need to build your capacity in understanding public-private partnership for you to become a PPP specialist. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, Andre, your thoughts? I'm going to try and squeeze one more question in if we can. So, uh, Andre, fairly briefly, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to add, and I'm coming from a finance background, so this is rich for me to speak about engineering. But what we see in the market is the engineering profession also on modernizing, if that's the right word, and specifically focusing on asset management because of fast changing technology aspects. The, in the big world out there, the uh, uh, utility type companies are increasingly better managing their operational expenses and in some cases decreasing their operational expenses on an annual basis by applying modern asset management techniques. Engineers working in governments, and I'm generalizing, uh, especially in Africa, are probably uh, 
uh, many of them are senior guys that have studied a long time ago. They are not applying modern asset management principles. In PPPs, governments have got an opportunity to jump from wherever they are into the modern area, uh, making use. Uh, the private sector will definitely apply modern asset management principles, the best technology available to, to, to find results, to minimize the long term operational costs. So, my call would be for governments to consider making use of PPPs also to, to jump from wherever they are to, a, to the modern technology driven world and, and, and minimizing costs in that way. Excellent. Thank you very much. Indeed, some great answers there. Now, we are up against the clock a little bit, but I do think um, it's relevant that we try and fit just one more question in. So we're going to be brief on this one because uh, we do need to finish on time. Charlotte, can we fit one more in, please? Yes, we've got a question from a, a live viewer. I'm sorry, I'm just getting it to be viewed. Um, his question is, if I'm working as an administrator on site in construction, does that really fall under project management? Okay, um, it can do, is the short answer. So there are a lot of different roles and scopes and responsibilities within different organisations. So, um, you know, there's a whole kind of spectrum here uh, to be working on. Certainly, if you're working um, in at the heart of a, of a construction project, um, then you're fulfilling at least part of the role of a project management office or the PMO, if you like. And that's one of the disciplines that come under the spectrum of project management itself. So um, all of these roles and responsibilities vary, of course. Some people have a very narrow, very deep um, uh, knowledge and experience and expertise in a particular aspect of administration on in construction and um, others will have a broader uh, range of activities that they're engaged with but it does sound to me like you know you have an opportunity there to broaden your discipline and start considering if indeed you know other roles and responsibilities either as a, a PMO okay running a great project management office or alternatively um, for taking that sideways step, if you like, into a different career, which is around the leadership of engagements and then the delivery of whole projects and programs and, and so on and so on. So um, very good luck with that. Uh, Nitin, thank you so much uh, for entering the question and uh, putting it in front of our panel. Now, look, we're going to move on uh, if we can, because we need to finish on time. So panel, super quick, please, if you can do closing remarks, Amon Deep and then Andre. Uh, good to be on the show and I'll advise all the viewers who want to become professionals to uh, do good job whatever the uh, field you are coming from, engineering, lawyer, you can become a PPP specialist. Only thing you need to integrate all the aspects, learn, do, uh, learn on different aspects of uh, PPPs and try to interview that and definitely you Thank can you move up to the higher level to become a PPP specialist. Thank you very much indeed, Andre, and then Sergey. Thank you. If I can add to what Amandeep is saying, uh, keep reading. There's a lot of material available um, on the internet, uh, from the GI Hub, from the World Bank, uh, from various organizations, in-country PPP units. Keep on reading. Uh, maybe if you want, just for the sector that you are interested in or working in, keep on reading. Thank you for the participation. Okay, thanks very much, Andre, Sergey, and then Nian Anso. It is uh, reassuring to see that people from so many backgrounds are considering a career in PPPs. And all of us with uh, years of careers in PPPs can attest to it. it's an exciting uh, area and uh, you will definitely uh, love being in PPP projects. Um, Thank you. I would say uh, look at the CP3P as a structure of knowledge on PPPs and keep updating your uh, understanding with following up on the new developments which appear basically weekly. Thank you so much, Sergei. And uh, Nienato? Yeah, it was good to be part of this and thank you to all the participants. Very, very interesting questions. So number one, if you want to be a PVP specialist, you need to learn, you need to subscribe to um, all the available PVP courses, the most comprehensive one, is a CP3P. 
And so it's important that you get that knowledge of PPPs. No matter your academic background, no matter your professional background, you can play a role in the PPP space. Thank you very much and see you sometime again soon. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks so much indeed, panel. Great job, everybody. Now, I'm sure that if you've been watching, you've been inspired by our panel today. And if you're getting value from the content, then please do leave a comment all right, below and help spread the world by liking and sharing you know, the video with your network. Um, the whole panel has been talking about networking and how such an important skill, isn't it, for us to do. OK, so you can do something very generous now as your next action. You can share this video so that other people can learn from it as well. You can also go online and search for and view all the answers. We've now got over 700 questions that have been answered through Level Up and other programs like Midday Mentors and so on on international, on apmg-international.com forward slash Level Up. All right, it's an amazing free resource. Um, it's a video library, okay, sectioned by individual questions with individual answers. And that connects you free of charge to over 80 experts from all over the world a whole range of different disciplines. All right, eight o'clock, Monday, GMT time on the 14th. We're going to be exploring the top 10 questions that we get asked all about agile project management. And then next week at this time on Friday, we're going to return to a topic rarely out of the news with a special look this time about how to become a NIST cybersecurity professional. Episode 50. Episode 50, crikey, is sure to be a big one. That's coming up soon as well. And on that one, we're going to be exploring the future skills that project managers are going to need, um, whether it's big data, whether it's analytics, whether it's being able to do advanced forecasting, whether it's from exploring servant leadership or thinking more about emotional intelligence. Be sure to log in early and reserve your seat for that one because it's a milestone episode and we're expecting a really big crowd. All right. So thank you very much, everybody. Sub subscribe to the show and we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.